Welcome to Balthazar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth, a series of conversations about the life and teachings of Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who is considered to be one of the most important Catholic intellectuals and writers of the 20th century. Incredibly prolific and diverse, he wrote over 100 books. He is also co-founder with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger of the acclaimed theological journal, Communio. It is the purpose of this series of programs to introduce some of the themes of Balthasar's work, and perhaps to help some understand better why Hans Urs von Balthasar is so important for modern theology and for the lived experience of the Church today. Balthasar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. In this episode, I am honored to be joined by Dr. Angela Franks to discuss a short primer for the unsettled layman. Dr. Franks is a theologian, writer, and mother of six. She serves as a professor of theology at St. John's Seminary in Boston. Her areas of specialty include the theology of the body, the new evangelization, the Trinity, Christology, and the thought of John Paul II and Hans Urs von Balthasar. She has spoken at numerous conferences, including the International Theology of the Body Congress and on EWTN, Fox News, and many other outlets. She has been published in America Magazine, First Things, Public Discourse, Church Life Journal, Catholic World Report, and academic journals in addition to contributing chapters to edited books. She has written two books on sexual ethics and the history of eugenics. In a short primer for the unsettled layman, Hans Urs von Balthasar addresses the critical issues facing today's Catholic layman, speaking plainly on those ideas and questions which have unsettled many of the Catholic faithful. He brings much-needed clarity into the contemporary confusion. We now continue our conversation on a short primer for the unsettled layman with Dr. Angela Franks. It goes back to what we discussed earlier, the importance of the individual, not just as an individual in society, but as the individual child who is created by God in his own unique vision of that particular person, of the particular me or you. And for us to be able to be aware, it's the relationship that we have with the Logos, with the Word, with Christ. We are called to follow him as a person is the child that is desired to be returned to the Father, and hence his mission. That's what I've always gotten from Balthazar, that it's important because these other things, if you let go of that relationship with Christ and that call that you have from the Father to follow off in these other areas, it can lead you down a path you don't want to go. Am Am I overstating that? Oh, no, I don't think you're overstating that. Yeah, it's like these these isms of modernity. I mean, every age has its own ism, so I don't want to imply that modernity is especially unique and having problems and, and things that, that pull us away from Christ. But but in particular in modernity, I mean, it's like we're, we're told, you know, come play in this Promethean sandbox, you know, and like, you know, make your life and make your identity and make whatever you're supposed to make your gender or whatever these days. And it's just, it's like this sandbox, you know, it's really, it's a really, it's a deep, these isms depersonalize because they pull us away from that unique personalizing mission that's bigger than us. You know, that's, that's the thing that, that Balthazar is always pointing us towards that the reality of God is truly transcendent and is bigger than us. And therefore it it invites us into something that's freeing that the horizons are way larger than way more expansive than we could have ever imagined in our own plans and dreams as we're playing in our little sandbox and and so rather than settle for these really very narrow ideas and imagination that we come up with. Balthazar is reminding us that what God wants to give us is, the, is something much bigger that's, that's genuinely personalizing instead of, in fact, um, depersonalizing. 
And when you talked about the three, the fabrics, the word, and also sacrament, but then the authority, that's all gift to the individual, isn't it? I mean, to the to the person. I, when I use individual, it almost sounds state-like, you know, <laughs> what I, for me, I mean, it's the person that we are called to be in relationship with the other persons, but the authority that's been given by the Father who has created us. So it's important to um, to recognize that. Sometimes when we think of individual and, and freedom and different things, and maybe I'm way off base on this, but sometimes we think, well, I have the authority then, that somehow it's the I, it's me. And that's not part of the, this particular gift, is it? Yeah, it's it's great you're recasting these in terms of gift because we can think of them as imposition, you know, something coming at us from outside me. Um, the the word that people like Kant like to use is heteronymous. You know, it's it's the law of the outs of the other, literally, right? It's coming at me from outside, and somehow we see this as being a threat and instead of being a gift, right? Gifts, gifts always do come at us from outside, right? There are, there are always something that they are, they are other that we can only first receive as opposed to, we don't fashion gifts, right? We, we have to receive them. Um, and so instead of viewing these gifts as being heteronymous, in fact, what we have to view them as being gifts. And he has a separate section on authority later in the book, and he, he emphasizes that the word in Latin, auctoritas, comes from the Latin word algere, in other words, to further something in its growth. That authority is to help, is to augment, right, to help something grow. And so it is um, it is genuinely a gift. It's supposed to be a service. Now, that doesn't mean that people who have authority do not misuse authority. We know that they most certainly do. Um, but that doesn't make authority thereby dis dispensable, right? It doesn't, just because people can misuse authority doesn't mean that we should we're going to just walk away from all authority because, in fact, we can't. Um, when he talks about ecumenism in this book, so ecumenism meaning dialogue with um, Christians of other denominations. He, he laments the fact that only in the Catholic Church do we have a unity, we have a unifying principle, which is the office of Peter, as he talks about at length in another one of his books. The office of Peter is a unifying principle um, that makes ecumenical dialogue possible. It's actually, I've done some ecumenical work. It's very difficult to have ecumenical dialogue with other denominations because there's nobody who authoritatively speaks for that denomination. So you're, there's really not, it's having a conversation is actually very difficult. So authority within the Catholic church provides that unifying principle. Um, and it's a particular kind of authority that is um, meant to really be service. And so he, he talks about how the priest um, doesn't exercise authority the way he says like a lawyer or a doctor does during office hours, you know, Monday to Friday, nine to five, but that rather what the priest's authority is derives from the fact that he has given his whole existence over to the church. And Balthazar uses the word expropriated. In other words, his, the existence of the priest is not anymore his own property but has been expropriated to the church. And, and that's one reason why, for example, priestly celibacy is, um, is so um, helpful to providing this expropriation. It's, it's a sign of this total self-gift that the priest is giving to the church. And so authority within the church derives from that kind of self-gift as opposed to from just simply somebody uh, making a power play, for example. I'm always struck by Balthazar, and you see it in this work as well. The, the, at the very, very heart of it is for us to enter in by our assent. It's the yes, or it's the no. It's either I say yes, and because of that, I received the baptism that is given as gift. But because I've said yes, because of the vow, is a reception 
that seems to be a, a very important thing for him. Yeah, that the he, his sex. I've, we talked a little bit about the first part of his multi-volume trilogy, the theological aesthetics, the, which is really dedicated to the question of beauty, how earthly beauty can be an, a means to reveal God's infinite beauty, His glory. Um, the second part of the trilogy talks is called the theodrama, and its its main theme is the relationship of God's infinite freedom to our finite freedom, and when people have thought about that relationship. There's an, an easy way to settle it is to say, well, really only one or the other is free, right? Either only God is really free and we're not really free, or we're really free and God is not. And people have taken those easy way out just because it's, it's just so much easier to think that way. And what's, what's much harder is to hold in balance God's infinite freedom that still makes space for our finite freedom and demands, as you say, that, that we make a free response to him. He's not going to save us without our agreement. And so the fact that we have to say yes, which is exemplified in Mary's fiat, and he has a long and beautiful section in this book on Mary as um, personifying the church. So when we talk about the holiness of the church, that holiness, which so very often is not personified in the members of the church, is perfectly personified in Mary. Why? Because in particular, she has that receptive yes to God's creative generative activity. And so that is the model for our freedom, that Christ dies for all on the cross, but that doesn't mean that we will all say yes, right? That, that each one of us is given this invitation to respond with that Marian fiat. Yeah, it, it's, I think uh, we sometimes forget that uh, we've, in our a yes, that is sent, the Balthazar talks about, it's a life-giving vow. And the fact that, Christ, he'll always say this, he said yes to us, it, to the point where he would die for us. That's how much that ascent is to the will of the Father, just gaze upon the cross. Yes, he has, he has a, few, a few points in this book. He has some beautiful meditations on the cross. And he, there are other um, theological explorations of the cross that, that make the, the cross itself less central in the sense that some theologians have said, well, God really could have saved us in any way. Christ could have saved us by shedding one drop of blood. And so there's something super abundant in what he does on the cross, but that the, the, it's viewed as being the cross itself being somewhat secondary to really God's salvific will. Whereas Balthazar is very clear that the cross is chosen as the way to save us. It's not, it's not an afterthought on God's part. It's, it's intrinsic to God's plan of salvation because it enables Christ, enables the Son of God made flesh to enter completely into our situation as sinners without himself being a sinner. So the Balthazar in this book, he talks about earlier in the book, how you have two different lines of human religiosity. He talks about this, uh, what a kind of horizontal line of, of action, right? That, that will engage in redemptive activity, will try to, to save the world from suffering. And so this very much this focus on action. And then there's this more vertical axis of prayer. And so you find this in more mystical um, traditions, including non-Christian ones, where there's this idea of, of the ascent of the mind and heart to God that involves leaving behind what's worldly and focusing on um, the one thing necessary that's spiritual. And so this horizontal and this ver these vertical axis, axes, what he says is what's missing is suffering and the cross. The fact that none of this is simply a technology, a religious technology, that if we just follow the IKEA instructions, right, God, what will result is our salvation, right? As though it doesn't involve any cost on anyone's part. Um, and 
so he says that the, the vertical and the horizontal really are only given meaning. They only become um, redemptive when they're suffused by the power of the cross, where God himself enters into our suffering place, this, this post-lapsarian, this post-fall reality of futility and death and suffering and all the bad things that came into the world because of the fall, that God himself enters into that from the inside. Um, so it's not in a, an external deal where God sort of stands at a distance and, you know, sort of strokes his beard and says, yeah, okay, I guess I'll forgive them, right? But instead he enters into our reality and experiences it from the inside. And so he taught, so Balthazar, a couple of places in this book, talks about how the cross is where that exchange between God, God coming into our place so that we can stand in God's place in a place of friendship with him, that the cross is where that happens. It's so interesting. There's this, in the section on exegesis, there's this beautiful passage that he writes that essentially says, Whereas in the case of a river can no longer distinguish the origins of its waters, a comparison of the different versions of texts in the Gospels often allows a return to the preliminary stages in which the entire figure was necessarily still seen imperfectly and partially. That idea of study, Angela, and that exegesis, sometimes it can be a good thing and sometimes it can be a troubling thing. Where is he falling in this? Yeah, Balthazar has a very nuanced relationship with contemporary exegetical techniques. So the what enters in, in particular after um, the Protestant Reformation, what what enters into the habits of um, of reading scripture becomes more and more scholars utilize methods that were developed in other fields. So in history, in linguistics, in um, literary criticism, they use those methods and apply them to scripture. So this was something new. We had some precedents for it, people like St. Jerome and so forth. But um, but in, in, in modernity, we this becomes more and more considered to be a... Um, an objective in scholarly task in which we can read scripture as scholars and make judgments about what the words mean, what the relative historical truth or non-truth of the passages are, and, and so forth. So Balthazar has always been very clear on the dangers of that approach. However, he doesn't just simply reject it. And in, in this sense, he's a lot like um, Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict, um, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, who does something very similar, um, having a heightened awareness of the dangers while also utilizing what's true and good about this method. And what's true and good is that uh, God does enter into our world. Jesus Christ does enter into human history in a decisive way in the incarnation. Um, he interacts with historical human beings, and these are human beings that you can study through the means of um, of historical methods. And so, there's something true about that. God does give him hand himself over in the in the words of Scripture to. Um, be analyzed, to be looked at. Um, and so we don't want to say that that God is not a historical reality or that um, these things cannot be helpful, these methods cannot be helpful, but they have to be used with the right um, objective. They have to come out of the right stance. It's, in other words, the scripture is not even though it is a book, it is not simply a book like all other books. The fact of the divine inspiration of scripture means that uh, we have to receive it in faith. And if we're not reading scripture out of faith, then it's, it's like somebody, this is a kind of a poor analogy, but it's, it's like somebody reading a book on um, the origins of the, the human being um, through, you know, biological, through, evolu through evolution, somebody reading that textbook who doesn't believe in evolution, like it's, 
they're just not going to be very receptive to the contents. Well, that kind of basic human reality of receptivity is doubly important when it comes to the being receptive to the revealed word of God and scripture. And so when we isolate scripture from faith, then we just simply don't, we're not capable of understanding what's truly there. And so Balthazar believes that a lot of harm has been done by um, Catholic and Protestant exegetes who are not operating out of a perspective of faith and that therefore they're, they're splintering up the word of God in human reconstructions instead of receiving the fullness of the form of Christ that's there. The way you describe that, I mean, it really highlights that for Balthazar, that, uh, as you said, the three fibers that create this garment, <laughs> this, this beautiful, this tapestry, essentially, of again, of the word, the sacrament, and authority, and how that you need to have those three in harmony, you do, essentially, in the Catholic Church. For him, this is where it is. This is where it's all found, isn't it? Yes, yeah. He's, so when he talks about, I think it's in the section on ecumenism, and, and certainly when he's reflecting on the Eucharist, the Eucharist requires the authoritative structure of the church for the Eucharist to, um, to be confected, for the Eucharist to, um, to be given to the people. Um, so when he talks, he talks about intercommunion. Intercommunion is the idea that, um, well, so it's usually done under an, under an ecumenical banner, the idea that, well, if we allow other believing Christians to receive the Eucharist in the Catholic Church, that this will further Christian unity. And he's, he's very clear that this is a non-starter, this, this idea, because he, he says at one point that the Eucharist is the expression of the full and not of a partial communion, and that it presupposes communion. And that communion, that unity of faith and life is safeguarded by the authority within the Catholic Church. And it's also that the same safeguard that enables us to really to receive the sacraments for the sacraments to be genuine um, because it does require not only a unity of love and of a partial communion, but of a full communion in the, the truth of the faith. And so authority is very much in the service of word and sacrament. It's not its own freelancing kind of office. Um, And it's in fact something that will disappear in heaven. I mean, we don't need, we don't elect popes and so forth in heaven. You know, it's not, it's not meant to be a permanent eternal reality. It's meant to be in service of the, the church in her pilgrimage to that eternal reality. Um, but it is important. It's required to have the, the word and the sacrament be transmitted genuinely to, to the people of the Catholic church. It does open a door that he does address, especially at the end of the book, in the section on political theology. I think we all have to read that (laughs) (laughs) and really take that in, because I think in this particular case, and yes, he, in a way, in 1980, of course, they were going uh, through the issues that were arising in Latin America. I mean, that seemed to be a, a very prominent issue. But I think it also can be said, as he chronicles, it's been something that the church has struggled since the time of Constantine, of how do we live out the Christian mission within the context of the body politic? Yeah, that's it's such a practical and important question. And um, for your listeners who might not be aware, especially if you're younger, so um, liberation theology came about generally in a Latin American context, though there are a lot of European theologians who are involved. And it focuses strongly on the uh, liberation of human, of human communities from injustice. Um, there were a couple documents from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith under then Cardinal Ratzinger in the 80s, in the 1980s, on how you can or cannot understand liberation and therefore liberation theology. And and essentially, the, insofar as liberation the, theologians were using a Marxist philosophy underlying their theology, then to that degree, 
those theologies were really compromised. They they weren't staying true to the, the truth of the faith. But even beyond something like liberation theology, so this heading of political theology in general, there there is no doubt that Christianity challenges political parties and political authority and so forth, insofar as it refuses to make this worldly authority the last word. And so even though the early Christians were um, not at all interested in overthrowing governments or what have you, um, they still were persecuted by, in particular, the Roman emperors. Um, Why? Because they claimed for Christ ideas and titles that the emperor wanted to claim for himself. And the Christians refused to compromise on this basic idea that Jesus Christ is the Lord of creation, the Lord of history, and not the Roman emperor or the Third Reich or whoever, right, would like to establish himself as being the ultimate word on, on human history. Christians have always said, no, it has to be Christ. You can only understand history through Christ, and he is truly the Lord of history. So Christianity has always challenged political authority in that to that degree, and has also challenged very often political and social assumptions and ideas that are unjust. But you cannot reduce Christianity to that sort of political activity. And so even people who are unfamiliar with liberation theology or who disagree with it or whatever, we can still be tempted to reduce Christianity to one other political program or agenda. We can have a, a, a party perspective on Christianity and make it simply a matter of um, of social justice or of um, of some kind of inner worldly progress. And I think these days, you know, we can be very discouraged when we look around us and see all kinds of attitudes and structures and um, and laws that contradict the moral law, that contradict what um, God has revealed to us, but also what we, we know through the natural law, through knowing what's just knowing what is um, pertains to human dignity, we can get very discouraged when we see that like the rest of the world doesn't seem to agree with us on these ideas of human dignity and, and human life and, um, and sexuality and all of the important issues that are, um, that are present today. But we don't, we don't want to simply reduce Christianity to the thing that makes this world better according to our whatever our ideas are because it's not that ultimately christianity is rooted in jesus christ who transcends this worldly comfort and justice and and who judges all of those things he's not just simply one more piece within the fabric of this world, he transcends it. And so that, that in, in a, it's only about four pages or so, that section on political theology, but it really has a lot to say to everybody on all different ends of the, the political spectrum, because we can, in, in, from any stance, that political stance that we take, we can misuse the gospel for our, our narrow political ideas. Yeah, it's, it's very challenging uh, and to the extent that makes us take a very good look at ourselves if we try to place our Christianity in a particular box, whether it's a a political party or an ideology or whatever that might be, because the light will not be contained in that box. It will find the cracks in the walls of that party, (laughs) and it, it it, it refuses to be contained. And for the Christian, it can be very difficult because, but that was so convenient for me to be a part of that particular movement or particular ideology. And I'm somehow I can put my Christianity away or that aspect of it away. Yeah, if, it goes back to what we talked about throughout this book of the being unsettled, right? We want to we wanna find a place that settles us. And so often we make that place not the form of Christ, but something else. Um, he says something beautiful. This is in the 
toward the end of that section on political theology. He says, when Christ finally drew all to himself, it was not in an earthly political, but in an eschatological way. And then he quotes from Luke 17, 10, if you have done everything, then say, we are useless servants. Christ may have been the first to have spoken these words to the Father. I think that's just amazing, this idea that Christ himself has this stance, the Son has a stance toward the Father of simply being of service, right? Of, of expropriating himself for this mission. And in the apparent meaningless of the cross was, despite all appearances to the contrary, the fulfillment of his entire earthly struggle, right? So maybe the struggles that we have in all of the the contradictions that the world puts in our life and and before us, maybe those struggles are precisely the redemptive thing that we're supposed to be doing, precisely our way of participating in the cross of Christ. It might be more fruitful to struggle and fail than, in fact, to have some kind of grand political success. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't, say that political success in and of itself is a bad thing. And so he continues, political struggle is given as a charge to the Christian. So God's not saying, well, yeah, just, you know, ignore what's going on around you and just, you know, hunker down in your prayer corner, me and Jesus, and (laughs) close your eyes. He's not saying that. But he does want us to be very clear that this is a struggle that very often it's going to feel like we're failing. And that that's part of our participation in Christ. So political struggle is given as a charge to the Christian, but he must know that the kingdom of God is not established within the structures of this world, right? The kingdom of God is not a matter of only inner worldly justice, inner worldly um, morality that ultimately, as you said, it's the, it's, it cannot be contained in the box of, this worldly political structures. And so, yeah, that is really, it's a really a um, call to uh, exa- an examination of conscience, I think, for, for all Catholics. That's so tough. It's mm. hard. It's a hard thing, you know, because we so want the convenience of it all. And that the cross is just not that convenient. I mean, it, it, we would like it to be, but it's just not going to be, is it? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I'm ex- expounding on Balthazar here and and mind you, I can't stand a hangnail, right? I mean, so it's like, <laughs> it's not like, like, in, I mean, we don't want, nobody wants to fail. And, and like, let's be honest, there's so, there's often a horrible cost as far as life and health and, you know, all kinds of horrible things happen when earthly injustices perpetuate themselves. And, and that's, we weep over that and we'd be, We'd be kind of pathological if we didn't, but but nevertheless, God's kingdom is not a matter of simply the cumulative addition of all of our worldly successes. That's not what it is. And because of the cross, we know that even our failures, even when people die, um, even the, the failures of justice in our system, Um, that God can bring good out of that. And that's what the cross shows us, that that Mm -hmm. God, it's not the case that God can only work with worldly success, right? He can also work with our failures and does. Yeah, and thank God he does. (laughs) Thank thank himself? I don't know. I don't know if you can say that, but but actually, that is so important to remember. Again, I mean, it would be so much easier to be able just to do what other people tell me to do and to think what other people tell me to think. And yet there is that niggling of that still small voice that's in each one of us because of that. Yes. The, a God who truly wants to know you and to have a relationship with you. And would have been really nice for that little Albanian woman, if she could have as that school teacher behind the compound walls just been able to stay within those walls. And yet that was not what the still small voice was asking her to do. Yeah. And it it was not, I, so I don't know if this is one of these apocryphal mother Teresa sayings, but but Mm -hmm. at least I've seen her quoted as saying that God doesn't need our success. He needs our faithfulness. Mm-hmm. And so she did not feel as though God was calling her 
to go out and be successful, right? You know, every right. person you touch, you're going to see that person convert in front of your eyes or, you know, every person you nurse is not going to die, you know, a horrible, painful, bitter death, right? Like that's not what she was promised. And she, you know, despite the awards and everything, she saw all kinds of failure all around her all the time and things that didn't seem to work. But she realized that God was really asking faithfulness from her and not worldly success. And and not, as you say, to just simply follow the crowd and do what everybody else had already done before her, but to be attentive to her particular mission from Christ. Angela, I could talk to you for and listen to what you have to share on this all day long, and and it still wouldn't be enough. I am just so appreciative for the, the, the time we've had now just to talk about the short primer for unsettled laymen. In closing this part of our conversation. Any final thoughts? Balthazar closes this book, as I mentioned, with a section on apocalypse. And to to get to the, you know, thinking about the book of Revelation, right, where we see lots of um, just kind of this cyclical treatment of all of these, you know, successes, then failures, successes, then failures, that he, Balthazar really wants us to remember that is he talks about the solution for the Christian. This is toward the end of that section. He says that the only thing that brings salvation is concentration upon the one form of Jesus, which is at the same time unequivocal and eucharistically all-embracing, the only one that is wide open to the infinite, to triune divine love, and just as open to creation. Since everything exists for the sake of that form and has stability in it, everything which through it is to be sheltered in absolute love. So I think I would end with that thought from Balthazar. Dr. Angela Franks, thank you so very much. Thanks for having me, Chris. This concludes part two of our conversation with Dr. Angela Franks, discussing Hans Urs von Balthasar's A Short Primer for the Unsettled Layman. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with many other episodes of this particular series, visit bonbalthasar.com. There, too, you can also access numerous audio excerpts from this book, along with others from the Balthazar Library. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will consider subscribing to this podcast and liking it on whatever platform you may be hearing it on. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about bonbalthazar.com and join us for the next episode of Balthazar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth.